Awesome. Wasn't that good? <laughs> awesome. Well, happy Easter, everyone. Thank you, thank you for being here. Isn't it good to be together this morning? Happy Easter. We're so glad that you're here. Listen, we know we are Living Word Church, and we know we have a, a, a lot of visitors with us today. If you're checking us out for the first time here this morning, maybe you've been watching online, um, but we want to welcome you this morning. We're so, so glad that you're with us. We want to invite you um, next Sunday, if you don't have a church home, uh, we want to invite you to Living Word Church, just down Ridge Road, almost to Williamson. Um, we've got Sunday morning services at 9 and 10.30 a.m. We'd love to invite you there. Uh, for those services. Um, we've got a small gift for you, if that's you this morning. Um, on your way out the, um, this morning in the lobby, uh, a visitor's mug, um, grab one of those. That's just for you, so please grab one of those. For visiting families um, with your kids, we've got a drawstring bag out there for them as well. So pick one of those up on your way out. Um, again, we just want to thank you for coming. Um, if you uh, would like to connect with us, we'd love to get to know you and your family. There's a connect card in that mug. Um, there's a prayer card as well for anything that might be going on in your life. We would love to pray for you as a church. That means a lot to us. So fill those out and then you can drop those in the box right here in the vestibule on your way out. So thank you. Thank you in advance for doing that. And uh, we're just so glad that you're here this morning. Um, thank you. Thank you for being here. Would you stand with me? We're going to continue now. and Let's pray together as we worship God. We're so thankful for everything that, that Resurrection Sunday means to us as believers. We pray that the worship and the, the message here today, everything that we do in this place uh, would, would be for your glory, and we give it all to you this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Lord, we're so grateful this morning for what you've done for us. Amen. Can we thank the Lord for our risen Savior, Jesus Christ? That's why we're here today. So glad to see all of you here today as we worship in one service. My name is Pastor Barton Joyce. I'm the lead pastor at Living Word. We just want to welcome you, especially those of you who are new. We're just thankful that you're here today. I, I just want to just give a quick thank you to our sound people. They worked endlessly to put this all together. Very grateful, all of you that work so hard behind the scenes. We are very thankful that we're able to do this and uh, grateful for Wayne Central for allowing us to, to worship here today. And uh, yes, wonderful, wonderful. Are you ready for some good news? How many of you want some good news? Good, I know it's 40 degrees out and cloudy, but I've got some good news. Um, I, I wanted to share with you this morning that there is one thing that every single one of us in this room face. There's one thing that we have in common. I know all of us here today, we have different backgrounds and situations and all that stuff, but there's one thing that we all share in common. One day we will die. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? <laughs> I just Googled it this morning. The death rate in the United States is 100%. So we are going to die one day, but I've got good news for you. Um, Jesus took the sting of death away for you and I. That's why we are here today. That's why we are worshiping today because we don't serve a Savior who is buried. We serve a Savior who has risen. Now, right, you may have come here today. Maybe you were promised a ham dinner after the service. Maybe you were guilted or shamed to coming today. Maybe you are given money. I don't know what, what, what your situation is. And maybe you haven't really thought about it too much. And I, I just want us to pause for this moment, for these few moments, and just reflect on what Easter truly means, what the resurrection truly means. It wasn't some time ago when my, when my uh, I've got two boys, they're older now, but when they were younger, they were out in a field playing with a bunch of other boys. They were playing army in the fields, and, and they, got, they got into a wasp's nest. It was, yeah, it, it wasn't fun. And um, the, the wasp was, was in the field. Yeah, aren't, aren't those fun? You just love those, right? And all of a sudden, we're in the house, and we just hear this yelling and screaming. We're like, what is going on? Well, the wasp got all up in their clothes, like all up in their pants and their shirt, and they're just running back to the house screaming. We're like, what's going on? He goes, we got into a wasp at the wasp. So we're just stripping them down to their underwear, as we're laughing, making sure that no one was allergic to wasps, then we laughed because it was hilarious. And, and so we're stripping them down, and there's still, they're still wasps flying. I mean, they were on them, and they were stinging them, and it was just, they felt bad. And the one thing I remember the kids saying, especially my, my one son saying, is just, stop the sting. Stop the sting. I said, well, I'm not going to, I don't want to get stung, so I'm, you're on your own. No, I'm just teasing. No, I'm just teasing. Um, stop the sting. So we tried to tried to, to remove the sting and get the wasps away from them. In fact, there is a, 
a product that's out there that's called Sting Kill. And what it does is, are these wipes that you can put on bee sting or a wasp sting that will kill the sting. I want you to know this morning that Jesus killed the sting of death for you and I. And, and, and we know that, that, that death is, is all around us. And, and I want to just pose a question to you this morning. Why is death so painful? There, there's a reason why death is so painful. The reason, there's a reason why there is a sting to it. And the Bible gives us the answer to why death is so painful. And, and, and it provides us, though, with an answer to overcome its sting. And I want you to know this morning that death is the result of sin. In fact, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. God sent his son to do something about the pain of death and the sting of death for you and I. And so what Jesus does is he came to overcome this devastating effect of sin by giving his life for us. And so our hope in Christ and our hope in him is this. He has the final say. Death no longer has the final say in your life when you are in Christ Jesus. Jesus said that even though you die, you will live. Now how, now, how can Jesus say that? How do we know this? Well, there's a book in the Bible, and, and it's, it's a book written by the Apostle Paul to a church in Corinth, and they had, this church had all kind of questions about the afterlife. They had all kind of questions like, what happens right after we die? And there's a question that arose in the church that said that they weren't going to have new resurrected bodies. That they, they, there was doubt about their hope after they died. And so what Paul does is he addresses this church and said, listen, everything about Christianity is about the resurrection of Christ. For without the resurrection of Christ, your lives would otherwise be meaningless. And so I'm going to read this passage for you in 1 Corinthians and just, just listen to what Paul says here. And I hope these words will give you hope today. Because I think all of us here at one time or another hopefully would have the same questions about eternity and I just want you to think about that for just a moment. Paul, speaking uh, to the Corinthian church in chapter 15, says this to them. He goes, but tell me this. And he's telling them about why the resurrection is true and that, and that they too will be resurrected one day. He says, but tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of dead, then, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. If that were true, none of us would be here today. And we, the apostles, would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave, but, we can't, it, but that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sin. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are to be more pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, and he is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death comes into the world through one man, speaking of Adam, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man, speaking of Jesus. Just as everyone dies, because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given a new life. But there is, there is an order to the resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, and then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. Boy, that's good news, church. That is really good news. He goes on into the same chapter. And I, and I read this many times when I'm at a, a graveside and for those who have passed away in the Lord. And I, and I want to give the people standing there hope that this is not the final say. This is not the person's final resting place. For those that are in Christ Jesus, will, we will be raised. What was, what was corrupted will be raised incorruptible. 
And for me, I'm five foot 11. I screeched right before I hit six foot, and I'm still mad about that today. But when I get to heaven, I'm going to be six foot 10, new resurrected body, and I'm going to be able to dunk. That's all I want to do. So the opposite's probably going to happen. I'll probably be four foot 10 or whatever. But, but here's what Paul, on the same chapter, Paul goes on to say What am I saying, dear brothers and sisters? This is what he says about don't put your trust in this physical body. How many of you are like me and you're getting older and you're feeling it, right? You can't put your trust in this body. He says this, our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will be transformed in six foot ten bodies. It will happen in a moment, in a blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown, and when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised forever, and we who are living will also be transformed, for our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death is... Where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, but the law gives sin its power. But thanks, but thank God, he gives us the victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I know this gave a lot of hope to that early church. And it gives us hope today. Paul is saying that everything rises and falls on the resurrection. And if it didn't happen, Christianity would unravel. If there's no resurrection, then what we believe is futile. If Jesus hasn't been raised from the grave, then he's not who he says he is. And I follow a risen Savior. And the reason why I know that is because, is because he did something in my heart in my life that changed me, that transformed me. And that's why I'm a follower of him. And I know there's many of you here today that you said, I live this old life. And when I came and I bent my, my knees to Jesus and I asked him to come into my life and I surrendered to him, something happened. Does that mean we live perfect lives? Absolutely not. Do we still make mistakes all the time? But there's a difference in your life when your heart's been transformed by a risen Savior. And all I can tell people, they say, well, Pastor, how do you know for sure at 16 years old your life changed? How do you know for sure? The only thing I can tell you is that I was blind and now all of, all of a sudden I could see. And there was people during Jesus' time that would try to trap him and say, well, can you really heal? Can you do these things? And you can go to the people that he healed. And there was one person that he healed. And the religious elite at the time were trying to corner them and saying, well, tell us the truth, tell us the truth. And he goes, the only thing I can tell you is this. I was blind and now I can see. And the person that did it was Jesus. So you go argue with him. You see, he does a transformation in our hearts and our lives that changes us. And if Jesus hasn't been raised from the grave, grave, he isn't who he says he is. But what Paul does is he goes further by saying, even if we believed in Christ only in this life, we should be pitied more than anyone else in the world. You see, not only does he change us now, but he changes us forever. What gets us through this life and the difficulties of this life is that we have a future hope that one day we will be resurrected and we will have new bodies that this world can never touch. No disease, no cancer, no aching knees, no aching back. I'm talking about myself right now. None of those things, none of those things can touch us. Everything about the Christian faith hinges on the resurrection. And what's interesting is the early disciples risked their lives and gave their lives because of the resurrection. This, this blows my mind, but I just I would think about this. I think about this all the time. Why, why would they give their lives for a lie? Do, do you think, think of the, out of the 12 apostles that saw the risen Savior plus the apostle Paul, and they're going out telling everybody that they've seen the risen Savior. Do you think one of the 12 would say, hey, guys, this was fun for a while, but they, now it's getting crazy? And we're going to have to give up our lives. I mean, I, I have, you know, I, 
my wife and I raised three kids, and and if if they were trying to get one over on us, somebody somebody out of one of them would break down, right? I remember that growing up. I had a twin sister, and an older sister, and my twin sister would always break down and tell the truth. My older sister, oh man, now we're gonna get in trouble with our parents, right? Someone someone always always gives in. You think out of those twelve apostles, somebody would have said something. But just the opposite happened. They laid their lives down for this truth, for this truth. And many of them gave their life for this truth. Luke Johnson, he's a, he's a New Testament scholar. I, I love what he says here. He says, some sort of powerful transformative experience is required to generate a sort of movement early Christianity was. Something happened that made Christianity explode, the resurrection. N.T. Wright, an eminent uh, scholar, uh, biblical scholar, says this. That is why, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind. That's all. It's the only way I can explain it. You see, the early disciples gave their lives for this truth. This is why they didn't give up under severe persecution. This is what gives us hope for today. Jesus conquered the grave to give us a hope, not just for now, but for the future. And I love what Paul says in verse 20. He says that Jesus is the first of a great harvest. He's basically saying Jesus is this first fruit showing us what our future is going to be like, that death will not conquer us either. So Jesus conquered it for us. He's this first fruit. Now, those of you that live in in Wayne County, I live in, in Wayne County. Give it up for Wayne County. We love Wayne County, right? What are we known for in Wayne County? Any, can, can I give you any kind of clue? Anybody, any kind of guess that, what are we known, what are we known for? Oh, there you go, our, our apples are, right? We, we are a bunch of fruitcakes. We, we, we love our, our fruit. We know, we know how to do fruit well. So, so if you work in any kind of the, the, the farming industry, you're gonna get this illustration because uh, much of you know Jesus people speaking to are farmers that they get this so he uses Paul used this illustration of Jesus this first fruit and, and and what does this mean well the term first fruit refers to the first sample of an agricultural crop that indicates the nature and the quality of the rest of the crop therefore Christ's resurrected body gives us a foretaste to those believers who trust in him It's a foretaste of what we can look forward to, that Jesus did this for us. He was the first fruit that we too also will be raised from the grave. We can trust it. That's why the early apostles gave up everything to follow Jesus because they knew their future was secure in Christ. The empty tomb gives us hope because death has been swallowed up. And Paul says this in the same chapter He says this, he says, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. There's not one person in this room that can overcome death in your own strength. None of us can. Jesus does it for us. Death is the last enemy. And you don't have to fear it when you're in Christ Jesus. See, through Christ's death, it no longer has a hold on us. Jesus killed death. He destroyed its power over us. Now, as a pastor, I do a lot of funerals, and you see firsthand how difficult and how death hurts, and it's a pain, and and how helpless it makes us feel. There's a sting to it, but Jesus guarantees us that death doesn't have to have the final say in your lives. You know, I think we make Christianity way too complex. I think a lot of people say, well, I've, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do this. You know what Jesus tells you to do? He tells you to believe. He says, come to me, and if you believe this, I will transform your heart. And when you believe in Jesus, you will recognize your shortcoming before him. You will recognize that you did your own thing, and you will fall before him. And when you do that, and you call out to him, he, he'll forgive you. He'll make you a new person. 
He forgives us of our past and our sin that, that kept us from a relationship with God. Jesus does this all for us by his grace and our belief in him. And he will transform your heart and he would transform your life. Does that mean life's going to be easy? Absolutely yes. No, absolutely no. Life still will be hard, but you have a different perspective. You have a different hope. The death does not have the final say. You don't have to be afraid of it any longer. Jesus guarantees us that death does not have the final say. I believe some of the greatest words in the New Testament come from the words of Jesus when he was trying to comfort his disciples and he was telling us, he was, wasn't with them very long, just a few years, and he's telling them, I'm going to leave you because I have to go and do the Father's will. He ha would have to go to a cross and give his life, his perfect life for you and I as our substitute on the cross for our sins. He bore them for you and I because he loved us so much. Not, not anything that I've done or merited in my life. He did it simply out of his grace and love. He gave his life as a substitute for you and I. And so the disciples are worried. And they're like, where are you going, Jesus? You're just with us. We're, you know, they're, they're fearful. And Jesus says these words to them, recorded, recorded for us in John 14. He says this to them, and he says this to you. For those of you who are fearful about your future, maybe you're fearful about what you did in your past. Maybe you feel like you're not good enough. That's not who Jesus is looking for. He's looking for people that simply come to him and lay their life down before him and say, I believe in you, that you're the only way, and I need you, and I need your help. Ooh, he loves those prayers. He loves it. He already knows everything about you, and he t still tells us to come. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried about the future. He said, trust, trust in who? In God, trust also in me. Notice how he didn't say, well, make sure you go to church every single Sunday, which is good, by the way. I hope you guys come back next week, which is good. He never said, read the Bible all the day, which is good. We should read the Bible. Notice what he says. What makes the difference? Trust. Belief. Trust in God. Trust in me. And he says this. There are more than enough room, rooms in my father's house. More than enough. And he goes, if we're not so, I'd have told you, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And when everything is ready, I'll come and get you so that you will also be with me where I am, and you know the place where I'm going. And no, 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 we don't know, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going, so how do we know the way? And Jesus says this. This is how you know the way. This is how you get to heaven. This is how your life changes. This is how your life is transformed. This is what's going to give you hope. This is what's going to take the sting of death away in your life. And don't trust the things in this world. They're going to fade away really quickly. Amen? He says this. Jesus told them, I'm the way. I'm the way. Not, not, he's not showing them a way. He says, I'm the way. And I'm the truth. I'm not going to show you just a truth. I am the truth because I'm God. I'm not going to just show you the way to life, but I am the life because I give my life for you. No one comes to the Father except through me. No other way, Jesus says, because he's the only one that conquered sin and death for you and I. And he says, if you really knew me, you knew my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you've seen him. When you've seen the Father, you've seen me because Jesus is God. Years ago, um, there was a couple in our church and her name was Norma. She was a nurse and she had to nurse her husband who was on hospice care and she um, was caring for him at her, at her home. And I was able to visit, his name was Richard. I was able to visit them in the home and I remember one morning Norma calls me and she said, Pastor Varden, I think Richard's getting ready to go. He's really close. I can tell by his breathing patterns. I said, okay. He goes, but he's asking for you. I said, oh, okay, I'm coming. Like six in the morning, I got up, I went to the house, walked into the bedroom. She had him so comfortable, and she was just there, just her and her husband. And um, I went over, I took Richard's hand. He saw me, I saw a little smile, and we just sat there and we prayed, and I was at his bedside. And we're just, there was such, all I can tell you, 
if there was such a peace in that room where we would be afraid to be in that room when someone's dying. But when someone dies in the Lord, there is no more sting or pain. Was Norma sad? Absolutely, because she was losing her husband. But there wasn't a sting there. And so I grabbed, I, I just held on to you know, Richard's wrist, and I felt his pulse. And as we began to pray, halfway through my prayer, I didn't feel his pulse. And he went on to be with the Lord. And I remember looking at Norma. It was such a sweet moment. And Norma said, I feel the Lord's presence in this place. For anyone else that doesn't know Jesus, they said, are you crazy? Are you, what, are you, what? Is your orange juice expired this morning? What is going on? Why? Well, what's wrong with you? You should be, you know, you know, sad and just crazy and just. But no, there was a peace. Norma was sad because she misses her husband, but she knew where he was going. And there was a peace there because there's no more sting. My question to you this morning is what are you trusting? Are you trusting your life? It's going to let you down. It will eventually let you down. The Bible calls, calls, calls this world just a vapor. It's here one moment and gone the next. Have you prepared your heart for eternity? Jesus came to show us the way back home to the heart of the Father, which was destroyed because of our sin and our waywardness. Jesus came to bridge that gap by giving his life so we could have a right relationship with the Father. Not only that, but we get heaven. We get eternal life. Death no longer has its power over us. We don't have to worry about that any longer because Jesus provided it for us. The empty tomb shows us that there is no more sting. So where is your life today? And I want to I want to pray for you today that you would have that confidence, not in yourself or your past or the things you have done or haven't done or feel like you've not done enough or what, what, or you're, maybe you're just trusting your own goodness where you just say, well, I'm just a good person. Guess what? That doesn't matter. There's not enough good things that we could ever do to approach a holy God. We will fall short every single time. Jesus, though, is perfect. And he did everything for you that you couldn't do for yourself. It's all about trust. Who are you trusting? And I'm trusting Jesus because he's true. He's truthful. He never lies. And everything he did, everything he said, he authenticated it. And the empty tomb proves it. What's your step? Your step is trusting Jesus. In your own way, as we pray, you just say, God, I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to put my hope in Jesus. I know that he can cover my sins. And I'm just going to trust him today. And I want to pray with you this morning because this will be the greatest decision you will have ever made in your life. Jesus has never let me down. 1982, I became a follower of Jesus when I was a freshman in high school, and he's never let me down. He's so good. He's so good. Amen. So I'm going to pray and then listen, we want to follow up with you. If if you made a decision today to to follow Christ, we have a a, a, a prayer card and just right in that prayer card, I made a decision to follow follow Jesus, put your information, we'll follow up with you. We've got a as you walk out the doors, there's a, a giving box there. And uh, on the giving box is a little booklet called What Now Free Bo Booklet. You can take that, and that will help you on your journey with Jesus, and we want to help you with your journey with Jesus this morning. That's why we celebrate the resurrection. That's why we celebrate Easter, because Jesus is risen. And it's not about something that happened 2,000 years ago. It's about something that's happening right now. There are a bunch of people in this room that Jesus has transformed. Can I hear a shout from you that Jesus has transformed your life? Amen. 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 So let me pray with you, and then we're going to close in a joyous, happy, uplifting song about what Jesus has done in our lives. And I want you guys just to thank him and praise him for what he did. Amen. So would you pray with me and for those of you that might have prayed this prayer for the first time, 
just with your heart, just be raw with God and just, he hears you. He, he, he hears your heart when you call out to him in his son's name. So let's do that. Father God, we bow our hearts before you today. None of us in this place are perfect. We've all fallen short of your glory, but we thank you for your perfect son, Jesus, who's done everything for us. And I pray for anyone in this room right now that has not made that step to trust you with their lives, to believe in you, to believe that you gave your life for them and have covered their sins. I pray that they would take that step right now as they call out to you. Thank you for transformation. Thank you for the hope of new life, not only today, but for forever, that, that these decaying bodies will one day be changed, transformed, where nothing can touch it any longer, no sickness, no disease, nothing can touch it, because you make all things new, and you start right now with making our hearts new in Christ Jesus. So I pray that, and I pray with those who said that the first time. And I pray for anyone here today that's just struggling with hope today, that's struggling, Lord, with their future. I pray that you would encourage them today to know their hope is not in themselves or in death, but in an empty tomb. So thank you, Jesus, that you promised this to us. You promised it to those early disciples and apostles. And so, Lord, we can trust you because you're true. So we love you, Jesus, and we thank you for everything you've done for us. And we want to be careful to ask all these things in the wonderful name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's children said, amen, amen, amen. Can we get the Lord? Yeah, let's thank him. God is good. Amen. You guys are already standing. You guys are ready to worship. Let's thank him for what he's done. Let's thank him for new life. God bless you guys.
Once again, thank you all for coming today and just celebrating this beautiful, beautiful day. We pray you just enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, before I let you go, if any of you need prayer, uh, some of the pastors, some other people will be down front here. We would love to pray with you, whatever you're going through. Otherwise, go in God's grace. Can we thank the Lord one more time for his goodness and what he's done? Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Happy Easter. Not at all, not at all.